Hi folks, your public land access is in jeopardy. If you're a hunter, an angler, or any type of recreationalist who enjoys public land across the western states especially, you need to sit up and pay attention over the next few minutes. This isn't just about an iconic prairie grouse. This is about your public land access. We made this film especially for you. I'm your host, Todd Helms with Wingmen by Eastman's. And I'm Mike Eastman, president of Eastman's Publishing. And this is about you. Thank you for watching and enjoy the film. What you're looking at over my shoulder is a piece of ground that's open to the public to use and these birds are out here doing their thing. This is an everyday occurrence in the spring and then when fall comes around we can go out and we have large numbers of birds to hunt as well. We need large tracts of, sa of unbroken sagebrush ground. This is something that should concern everybody, a member of the public, whether you hunt big game alone, fly fish, it doesn't matter what your sport is. The fact that a once very widely distributed, very abundant, and pretty liberally harvested species was even proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. It should be a wake-up call. A wake-up call and a concern to everyone. 350 plus species of plants and animals have some level of dependency on this unique ecosystem. And it's mule deer, pronghorn, so it's not just about sage grouse. What we're going to be exploring in the next few minutes is the story of the sage grouse, the story of boom and bust, if you will, from sage grouse numbers so large that when they flew, they sounded like a train taking off, all the way to where we were a few years ago with the sage grouse on the cusp of being listed on the endangered species list. okay, if there's concern regarding these birds, why are we hunting them? You know, scientists, managers have been looking at this issue. They've never once considered hunting a primary threat to the species. It obviously takes individuals out of the sure. population. Sure. The focus has and should be on habitat. What Wyoming itself is really ground zero for the West's entire population of sage grouse. You know, so you look at 11 state region and then you boil it down to where about half the birds live, they're here in Wyoming. Because of a number of different factors, drought, predation, development, disease, and, and lots of other factors, sage grouse, they've had a rough road the last 30 to 40 years. Why is it important? I mean, it's an iconic species. It's like mule deer and you know, who wants anything to go extinct? And they're just so sensitive to disturbance and development. So where Wyoming, I think, has done an exceptional job is developing some, some very high level, I mean, from the governor's office on down, policies to protect sage grouse. Because in the, on the modern landscape, the sage grouse declines that we're observing, the mule deer declines that we're observing are absolutely real. One of the big reasons that I wanted to get involved is this. I know that those two species cohabitate and if with, what's good for one is good for the other. And if sage grouse gets put on the uh, endangered species list, it's going to affect deer and it's going to affect us recreating. There's probably been more efforts to conserve sage grouse than probably any other species on the planet. The amount of work that's gone into sage grouse conservation from a policy perspective, from an on the ground habitat perspective, it's far surpassed any what's gone on with any other species. The challenge for Wyoming is we've got declines in areas where we've got a lot of development, we've got declines in areas where we've got moderate development, 
and declines in areas we have no development. So we clearly have to look at tackling you know, the sage grouse problem with a much, much wider scope and certainly wider lands. We absolutely contribute uh, and we absolutely have impact as an industry. There's no question of that. Uh, how much of an impact and how much we can mitigate that, uh, we're still working through and we're seeing great progress. So the bigger question is uh, what's going on with the sage grouse population range wide uh, that needs truly landscape level approaches. There have been grouse that have been documented to move between their winter range and their summer range, pushing 100 miles. They are truly a landscape species. The area we're in right now, the, the term the Golden Triangle has been uh, coined for this uh, particular area. And one of the reasons for that terminology is, is the sage grouse density, uh, as well as some of the big game values here in terms of migratory mule deer, pronghorn, and, and uh, wintering elk down here. So it's got a lot of wildlife values. It's a relatively undisturbed landscape. From a sage grouse perspective, it's the highest density in the universe of sage grouse. Nobody's home. The work that was going on here in 1950 that ended up with the book called Sage Grouse in Wyoming. Robert Patterson had about 40 some lex in this country that he monitored and we've gone back since and now there's about nine of those that are still active. So it's it's kind of this accumulation of impacts. None of them intended to be negative. Well, they're, they're negative probably from the sagebrush perspective, but it, it's not a negative intent on the people behind that. I worked on three listing decisions. The very last thing anyone wants to do is list a species because not only is that species then in trouble, not only has our wildlife management quote unquote failed, but that ecosystem on which the species depends is in trouble. If we have to give up the sport of hunting this great bird, then we failed on the habitat front. Yes. And we don't have to. We've done this before and it's not insurmountable, yep. but it's it's the we're running out of time and I'm not an alarmist, Todd, but we need to act now. We need to really get these habitats in better condition. Amazing shot. He had 15 Phenomenal. feet of lead. Of, I'm behind him, obviously, on the first one. Is that all that way out? <laughs> we need to couch this in a way that we can create jobs, we can create an economy around restoration. Look at what Matt did at the Pathfinder. Those grouse still do their thing in the snow. Yeah. You know, our grouse bank currently, we, our top customers are in the, the regulatory business. They need to offset a disturbance that, that is part of their uh, development or their production. Give us an example. Well, whether it's a, a wind farm, an okay. oil derrick, a cell phone tower, you know, a pipeline, a power line, the things that we need as society. Right. So the, the demand for, <coughs> for energy is not going away. Right. In Wyoming, through the core area strategy, there is an opportunity then when that disturbance occurs to offset that disturbance through a mitigation bank. When you talk disturbance, you're talking like when a new site is built, when they put in a wind farm, there's, there's a lot of disturbance that goes on to the habitat, to the ground itself, and the sagebrush community and everything involved. They can then purchase these credits from Pathfinder Ranches That's correct. and others like you to offset that disturbance Correct. and it goes into conservation for animals. It, and not just conservation, but at least at Pathfinder Ranches, it goes into perpetual protection. What you see here 
It's a dynamic working landscape that supports wildlife. Right. That goes under easement and that remains in perpetuity. No kidding. Sagebrush habitat, the best of the best. Really high quality habitat, high value for sage grouse and other species. Losing 1.3 million acres of that a year. Holy smokes. We only have about, just no, we, I think we have 32 million acres of it left, and we're losing 1.3 million a year. And what's worst case scenario look like when it comes to sage grouse? Worst case scenario, we've been facing it for a while. Like it's, it's out there and it's still a threat out there. And that's that we can't figure out how to turn the tide on this downward population trend and bring right. them back and that they ultimately get listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And if that happens, right, that's bad for the bird. That's bad for, that's bad for everything. Like, we don't want that. Is that funny stuff? I don't know if people understand how powerful the Endangered Species Act is, but if you suddenly had a, a listing of a species that is endemic to probably 40 to 50% of Wyoming, it affects everything you do. The economy is affected. Every well that gets drilled would have to go through an ESA consultation. It brings in the concept of take. Take is to harm or harass the species. There are immense fines and penalties for that. It would affect agriculture. It would affect tourism. It affects everything. And the point is, we don't want there to ever be a need for that. We want to be doing things that keep that species on the landscape uh, in perpetuity. Once they're there, man, it's so hard to get an animal off that list. And I'm worried that once they're gone, they're gone. And, once, and we said, they're an icon. Well, if we lose that bird, we lose access to that bird, we've lost part of who we are. Once you get to an ESA listing, it changes the entire dynamic of the situation. And what happened in 2010, prior to that, it was found to be not warranted for protections at that particular time. In 2010, it was determined to be warranted but precluded. And what that means is that it was warranted for protection under the Endangered Species Act, but it was precluded because there was a whole suite of other species. It's a workload issue. Right. And they just had to bump it down the list. There were species of higher priority. It's not that the states weren't concerned or managing no. sage right. grouse, they always have been, but this put a new level of urgency because to get a petition for listing and to get a, a warranted decision, you have to meet various criteria. And one of them is addressing these threats. One of those threats could have been hunting, but it wasn't. It was primarily habitat loss. But the bottom line is that we had to have this comprehensive strategy of federal lands, states, and state conservation plans the sage grouse implementation team. Governor Friedenthal, which is three governors back now, right. he tasked you with that. What is it and, and how is it unique and what's your role in that? So Ryan Lance, who was on his staff at the time and I were tasked with that. And we came back to Gov Dave and said, you know, we think we ought to create a, a multidisciplinary group that actually sits down, makes a recommendation back to you uh, we'd include industry, environmental groups, mining, agriculture, uh, all of the agencies, federal and state that are affected, county commissioners. So my role is I'm the chairman. So you have this about 26 people total that serve on that group. They're passionate, they're intelligent, and they're very, very uh, well read on the topic. And so they represent their particular, not point of view, but their user group, if you will. 
as we started, we were humming right along. We had two goals that we wanted to meet. We, we wanted to prevent the need for listing sage ground. And secondarily, we wanted to maintain our economy. Well, our economy is dependent on extractive minerals. Our economy is dependent on agriculture. It's dependent on tourism. Those are the, the big three that, that we have. And so you had to have those people at the table to where they could represent. It's never really happened well in, in Wyoming or in conservation or wildlife that you have all of the stakeholders coming together in doing that. It's a new way of thinking and a new way of doing business. We did it again with migration and the governor signed an executive order on a migration, mule deer migration. Yeah. Again, first one in the country. It works. It works if, you're, if your people are honest with each other and if they're dedicated and you keep your goal fairly simple. And I think we have a, just an absolute enormous opportunity right now, like a generational opportunity, because we've had, we've had the want and the will to do, but there have been limitations. You can have all the want and the will to do something, but if you don't have the, the financial support to make it happen or the tool, all the tools you need to make it happen, it's hard to get it across the finish line. Yes. But one thing we had happen is we had Congress this past year invest for the first time in my career in a really, really substantive way in large landscape restoration. Wildlife conservation doesn't happen overnight and we right. gotta recognize with sage grouse that we're not gonna turn the corner on a dime. We gotta be committed over the long haul to to bring it back. I love that perspective. I think you, I think that is so spot on. In today's world, we're impatient in everything. You know, if it's not instant gratification right in the palm of our hand, we lose interest pretty quickly as a society. And the sage grouse thing is the, is the long game. You don't have to be a hunter and angler to, to support conservation. Buy a conservation stamp. In other states, it might be a habitat stamp. Buy a bird license. It doesn't matter if you, hunt or not hunt, that can be your contribution. You know that that money is going back to that agency that's charged with managing that wildlife. We could point to all sorts of conservation success stories, whether it's elk, whether it's pronghorn, they're thriving and they weren't at one, at one time. That's the goal with sage grouse. And that's been the most incredible thing about this process is that it's not about your particular interest above all. It's about sage grouse, it's about habitat, and it's about how do we do this intelligently and leave the pieces there so that we are not jeopardizing the bird. Thank you for watching today. I hope this gives you a little bit of better understanding at what is at risk. We spent two years making this film and involved in this project. It's big, it's vast, there's a lot of moving parts. In mid-winter of 2023, we're going to release the full-length film so you can see exactly what is going on. Not only how you can get involved, but the complexity of our conservation and how one species can affect another species and how it can affect our economy. Stay tuned for the full-length film coming midwinter 2023.